Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, running in the 2011 general election for Prime Minister of Canada. And this is to alert you to the dangers of low-level radiation. It's the Dr. Oz show, and it had an expert on it and a real doctor, and you're going to get to see how a lot of them don't know what they're talking about when they say that the danger from fallout is minuscule and not to worry about it. You should. What should you believe? What is actually a health risk? And what is hype? I've enlisted our affiliates across the country to join my truth team, starting with our Houston affiliate, where the buzz is all about the disaster in Japan and how it might affect all of us a world away. Hi, Dr. Oz. Rachel McNeil with KPRC Local 2 in Houston. Like so many Americans, Houston residents are keeping very close tabs on the dramatic developments with the crippled nuclear power plant in Japan. Houston lies less than 100 miles away from its very own nuclear reactor, putting us at risk. With an explosion like the one in Japan, Three Mile Island, or Chernobyl, radioactive material is carried by tiny droplets in the air. Those droplets can be inhaled directly in your lungs or washed into the ground and ocean, contaminating your drinking water, crops and wildlife, and raising everyone's risk of cancer, especially children. So is that clear? Low-level radiation is a real danger, especially to children. People here in Houston and all across the country are wondering, are we safe? Whether a catastrophe like this happens in our backyard or halfway around the globe, Dr. Oz, what's the truth behind the headline? Are you safe? You've got radioactive waste in dumps all over the country, and they got to be kept cool forever or they explode. So, are you safe? Not likely. Thanks, Rachel. Joining me now to tackle the truth behind the headlines is Dr. Michio Kaku, the leading authority on nuclear radiation and the author of Physics of the Future. Okay, so he's the leading authority on nuclear radiation. We'll see. And Dr. Sonora Kumar, an oncologist and a Fox News contributor. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good news. A doctor of cancer. She should know. Let's go out to the people of Japan. And back home in the U.S., a lot of us are worried about our safety, too. So, Dr. Kaku, let's get to the very foundation of this. How does radiation, a catastrophe in Japan, travel all the way to affect this in the U.S.? Radiation could be spread by food, passengers on transcontinental flights, and also, of course, the air. The air. Think of a smokestack with smoke coming out, winds blow it in a plume. The plume then can sail over the Pacific and reach the United States. Gee, just like Chernobyl eventually polluted the whole northern hemisphere. Now, at Three Mile Island, also at Chernobyl, believe it or not, you and I all have a piece of Chernobyl in our bodies. You're kidding. Isn't that just what I told you in my very first video, that we all had some radioactivity from Chernobyl in our bodies? Even after all these years, radiation went around the world several times, but it's harmless. I guess since they stopped publishing mortality statistics, he doesn't think there's any mortality. Didn't read Deadly Deceit. Didn't do his homework. Uh, right after the Chernobyl accident, iodine was found in milk in New York City, but it was below the legal limit. It was found in the milk in New York City, but don't worry, it's below the government's legal limit. And they've just raised it. So let me give everyone a map of the world. This shows exactly what we're talking about with Dr. Kaku. So here's Japan where the disaster happened. And as that plume spreads across the Pacific Ocean, it'll first make landfall on the western coast of this country. But of course, it could spread further from there in the many ways that Dr. Kaku outlined. And it could spread further from there in the many ways outlined, including by the air. So we've got a little demonstration that Dr. Kaku designed for us to help us understand why radiation is not as severe by the time it hits our coastline as it is to folks who are living near the disaster in Japan. If you don't mind joining me. All right. So let me set the scene for you. Pretend that the water is the atmosphere, right? And if you're very close to where the radiation is released, you don't have much atmosphere to play with. As it diffuses further away, you have a lot more atmosphere. And when it comes to this country, you've got this much atmosphere around you. So what he's saying is that the radioactive particles become more dilute by the time they get to the United States. So that, yes, you're breathing in so many liters of air every minute, and there's hardly any radioactivity at all. But if it gets in you, 
then it's going to start blowing cells and causing cancer. So, but much less chance over here. But if it gets in you, then you're going to die. So take it away. Right. They sometimes say that the solution to pollution is dilution. The solution to pollution is dilution. Well, not with radioactivity, it's not. And so here we have the concentrated pollution in a small, small area, like, like right next to the reactor. And pretend these droplets are nuclear fallout, with radiation in whatever form possible. Right. Now let's assume that this is the, the Japanese islands in general. And so you can see that the concentration is much less as the winds carry it 100, 200 miles away. And by the time it reaches the United States, it is diluted by quite a bit. Oh, it's diluted quite a bit. How scientific. What's quite a bit? 20% less strong? Can you see the color difference between these? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it should be profound. Now, at some point, there's always a little radiation around us. By the time it gets diluted enough, it doesn't frankly matter anymore. That's the point of this. That's right. By the time it gets diluted, it doesn't matter anymore. Well, of course, they're not talking about the exponential effect. When it comes in from a meter to a centimeter with only one hundredth of the protection left, that's not a hundred times more deadly. It's hundred squared, ten thousand. And when it gets inside you and it's only one micron away, that's a million squared, a trillion times more deadly. Notice they don't talk about the exponential effect and why low-level radiation is so deadly. So now a lot of folks are worried about the, their safety, but what I'm most concerned about personally is not the air. I think we've convinced you now by the time it gets here, it's not much of a threat, but how the food in Japan might get contaminated by this nuclear accident. So we've got a little uh, animation that might bring us alive. Now they're going to give us an animation of how they think it works. And remember, these guys don't have any mortality statistics to prove anything. Right. And so food has definitely been contaminated in the area. Here we have the radiation containing iodine, cesium, and strontium coming out of the reactor. And when it rains, these are water soluble. It gets into the soil. Cows then pick it up. It gets into the milk. So vegetation and milk, those are the main avenues by which it has entered the food chain, even tap water hitting Tokyo. So a lot of people in Tokyo. That's right. That, that so it enters the food chain and the water chain, too, and the air chain. Dr. Coomer, talk to us a, a little bit about how radiation, especially in our foods like this, might influence our general overall health. Finally, a doctor of medicine instead of a doctor of philosophy. Well, what happens is the radiation particles then get absorbed into our bloodstream and into our tissues, and they cause the release of free radicals. And it's those free radicals that end up damaging the cells in our body, and that can weaken our immune system, and that's what can lead to cancers and to degenerative diseases. Isn't it too bad she didn't explain the exponential danger and damage done by the really, really close radiation that gets ingested, just that it causes a lot of cancers? Well, why? Because it's an exponential increase in damage. And then even on the short term, you can have what we call radiation sickness, where you can have headaches, change in your appetite or loss of appetite, uh, GI symptoms, uh, some neurological deficits as well, but certainly um, you know, severe headaches. And it's tough to pinpoint anything. There's so many things mm -hmm. you identify. Right. Here are the foods that I'm most concerned about uh, in Japan. If without question, seafood will be ultimately affected, like tuna. You can have problems with seaweed, but also vegetables. It can actually get into the water and infect the beer. Uh, it, even the milk, because it gets into the, to the dairy products, the way as we talked about there. So, you know, and these, these are concerns. Not, to my knowledge, again, it's a very you know, fluid process. I, I know Japanese spinach has, has had elevated levels of radiation, fava beans, okay? and of course the tap water, as you mentioned as well, has had uh, you know, a demonstration little of a little bit of elevation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's changing. We're not sure what that really means yet. All right. So, the FDA recently banned milk, fruits, and vegetables grown in radiation-affected areas from entering this country. Yes, but American milk's being affected by the radiation falling in America, too. So what good is it worrying about the Japanese milk when our own milk is bad, too? Are you concerned about this contamination affecting the U.S. population? No, in the sense that we have strict controls over food products entering the United States. Okay, so it's not going to be too much trouble to stop the radiation coming in on the food. Now what's he going to do about the radiation coming in in the air?
States. Uh, after 9-11, we're very worried about dirty bombs. We have radiation counters. Right. So our customs officials can very easily scan foodstuffs for radiation, while it's difficult to scan for explosives. Oh, isn't that cute? Making the smuggling in of a terrorist bomb, which never happened, sound as dangerous as the radiation that's going to get in, which has happened. So I know a lot of folks have run out and bought these potassium iodine pills, especially in the western states. There's been a run on, the, on these stores. You can't even find the stuff anymore. And, of course, the thought is that it will help prevent thyroid cancer. Dr. Coomer. You, you, she's a thyroid cancer survivor, everybody. She, she, has, you know, she has a unique perspective on this, and you're also an oncologist. Right. Well, that sort of explains why she's so right so far, and he's so wrong so far. So what is the benefit of folks rushing to get these pills? Well, at this point, there's going to be very little benefit to anybody that's on the West Coast. These are really designed to give to people that are directly affected from a nuclear accident. So for people that are in California to take these um, excess potassium iodide pills are really at the risk of just hurting themselves, and they are really at, at helping themselves at this particular point. So someone is sitting at home watching this show, they've already bought the potassium iodine pills, what should they do with them? If you have potassium iodide pills that are the pharmaceutical dose, which are 300 to 700 times what you're buying from a natural supplement, you need to just get rid of those because they can potentially make you very, very sick. Folks, are you hearing that? Yes. Right. Th those you know, big doses of potassium iodine that some folks have bought out there do not take them, throw them away, you don't need them. As odd as it sounds, I'm concerned about protecting your thyroid gland by making sure you don't take those. Instead, do what we know has been effective. You want small doses of iodine for long periods of time. I don't care what she says. This is my iodine Lugol solution. Sure, it's diluted. It's not the powerful like the pills, but I take my couple of drops twice a week and I'm um, betting it's going to keep me safe. So over the next 30 days, I want you eating the right food. Did you hear that? For the next 30 days, iodine to protect your thyroid, okay? The next 30 days. Does that sound to you like it's some faraway menace or are we living it now? You can get some iodized salt, as long as your blood pressure is okay. Strawberries, milk, spinach, these are all high sources of iodine. You're not going to have to worry about your thyroid hungrily sucking up radioactive contaminated iodine. That's right. If your thyroid doesn't have lots of iodine, it's going to pick up the radioactive kind. So it's better to load it with regular iodine so it doesn't pick up the radioactive kind that causes cancers. And this information, the concern about it came from Chernobyl. You all remember Chernobyl? Right, the big new, what they found was people who lived around there who had low iodine levels had a higher rate, risk of thyroid cancer. That's the takeaway message from this. All right, Dr. Coomer, thank you much, Dr. Kugel. Thank you for all you have done. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a great honor to have you on the program. Both of you have shared a lot of wonderful information with us. Final point. In previous videos, I said that, yes, iodine Lugol was good for you. I also take vitamin B17 to kill cancer in apricot seeds and I do urine therapy to recycle the cancer killers and I also want to mention that baking soda I've been doing a teaspoon every morning and every night baking soda is good for radiation and for cancer by making your body alkaline because cancers need acidity in order to thrive so the baking soda is something else you should take it's cheap it's worth it what do you got to lose